Our second reading this morning comes to us from Luke's Gospel, in the fourth chapter, verses 14 through 21. Listen for God's word to you this morning. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding region. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me. To bring good news to the poor, he has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him, then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today's reading fills me with more questions than it does answers. It chronicles Jesus's, Jesus returning from the 40 days of temptation following his baptism, to begin his ministry in Galilee, where we are told reports about him spread throughout the whole surrounding country. To borrow a, a phrase, a modern phrase, word about him, what he was saying, what he was doing, went viral. Now, that term has grown a little less comfortable since the start of a pandemic that has reminded us that Something that's viral isn't really a good thing. Still, the phrase get, gets used today to describe the sudden popularity of an article, a video, a tweet, a post that people pass along, spreading it exponentially. I imagine that gaining the kind of notoriety in first century Palestine was far more difficult without YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, and other social media to speed it along. Jesus had none of that, still word spread about him. This is where my first question comes in. Did word about Jesus spread all the way back to his hometown, or did he just travel there on his own? In the age of pedestrian travel, a journey from Capernaum in Galilee to Nazareth would have been something of a trek. Maybe not as far as going all the way down to Jerusalem, but not in the neighborhood Jesus had been circulating in either. So why did he go back? Was he hoping his mom could help him with his laundry? I mean, Galilee can get pretty dusty. Maybe he just needed a fresh change of clothes. Or maybe he missed his family. Sure, he was starting to attract a following, but... Fans and disciples aren't the same as your family. Or did he return to Nazareth because the word about him had gotten all the way back there? Perhaps the neighbors said something to Mary. We, uh, we hear your son's making quite a name for himself in the synagogues by the lake. Oh, really? She might have said. When's he going to make time for us? We'd love to hear what all the fuss is about. Sure, Mary might have murmured, proud but a little embarrassed to hear about it all secondhand. She might even have sent word to him, come see your mother, she could have said. We hear such things about you. 
For whatever reason, he finally comes to Nazareth, and no sooner is he home than he finds himself in church with everyone who had known him since the day he returned from the Jerusalem temple as a babe in his mother's arms. It doesn't come as a surprise that he's at the synagogue. Luke explains that it was his custom. Wherever he found himself, it was his custom on the Sabbath day to seek out a place of prayer, a place to gather with others in community, to listen together for a word from God in Scripture. It wasn't his obligation. It wasn't his choice from a list of options. Uh, Let's see, do I... Do I have brunch with Peter? Uh, Play a quick round of 18 holes? Go for a hike or go to the synagogue? No. It was his custom. It was what he did because that was who he was. That was his place. Those were his people. Any more so much of life gets reduced to the things we have to do and the things we want to do. We barely even have a way of talking about the things we do that fall outside of the binary of that equation. The things we do because they are essential to who we are. Are we here because we feel like we have to be here? Most are here because they want to be here, but as those baptized into the body of Christ, the community we call church, the weekly practice of worship that gathers us to one another and opens us to what God has to say to us in Scripture is part and parcel to who we are. It's the thing that makes us church, whether we happen to be in town or out of town. But it's one thing to attend church. It's something else to get up in church read scripture, and have something to say about it. So the next question that I have is, whose idea was it? Whose idea was it for him to get up and teach? Was he invited? Hey there, young man, why don't you come share some of that wisdom we've been hearing about from our friends at the Capernaum Synagogue? Was he volunteered by his mom? I hear that's something moms do sometimes. Why don't you ask Jesus to say something? I'm sure he'd be happy to. Or did he ask? In the tradition of the Society of Friends, commonly known as the Quakers, the silence of the meeting is only broken if a person feels compelled by the Holy Spirit to say something. We've just been told by Luke that Jesus is filled with the power of the Spirit. Maybe that's what compelled him to stand up and read. I don't know, but what comes next is a matter of debate. Did he pick these words from the prophet Isaiah? Luke says the scroll was given to him. Did he ask for it? Or was this the one that they'd already chosen for that day's service? Did he find the passage on his own? Or were these just the words he opened up to? It's hard to know. But the answer to those questions might inform my next set of questions. Namely, was he nervous? I mean, it's not like this was the first time he'd gotten up in front of a crowd... They were told he'd been teaching in the synagogues around Galilee. Still, teaching strangers you barely know is a far cry from getting up in front of the people who've known you since you were in diapers and then trying to speak with some authority. Maybe he wasn't nervous until he saw those words in front of him. Maybe it was only when he began to speak these words he no doubt heard his whole life growing up going to synagogue that he understood for the first time just what they meant in light of what had just happened, in light of his baptism. Maybe he understood for the first time what it meant both for him and for them, those familiar faces was God's beloved. If 
the dove that he saw descending on him was the Holy Spirit, then that meant the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. That he was anointed. Did he start to panic? Knowing that if he dared to suggest such a thing to his hometown crowd, they'd likely have something to say about it? Was he afraid, even from that moment, we'll be faced with a choice? To say what we think they want to hear, what we're expected to say, what will be accepted and praised, or to speak about the calling of our own baptism. That the Spirit of the Lord is upon us, too. To first see the poor, and then to bring them good news. To recognize when people are held captive, held captive to their own egos and the need to be right, the need to win, held captive to fear, held captive to anger and pain, held captive to their insecurities and uncertainty, and to say what we can to release them from whatever it is that is holding them captive. To call attention to things that others are blind to. Hard things, yes, like systemic forms of racism and entrenched abuses of patriarchy, but also the realm of God's presence and power all around us that is making things new. To recognize the places where people are still oppressed by systems of power or unhealthy families or harmful cycles of poverty and work to set them free. To say fully and unequivocally that God is for us. That God's judgment is ultimately one of mercy that is in humanity's favor. course, to say all that might get us some funny looks. Or worse, people might turn their backs on us and wonder why we can't just be who they want us to be. Might get us uninvited or run out of town. Will we say what we know to be true. What the calling voice of God would have us be and do. Or will we say what we have to to keep from rocking the boat and making waves? The Apostle Paul poses the question in his letter to the church in Rome. If God is for us, who is against us? And sadly, the answer to that question is plenty of people. There are plenty of people who find it easier to tear down and deride what they don't understand, what challenges their expectations and threatens their worldview, than to embrace the powerful words of the prophet as they find fulfillment in Jesus. That was certainly the case that day in Nazareth. And it's still the case today. But Jesus spoke the truth anyway. Because in the end, this good news of God's favor is the only thing that will set any of us free. Hallelujah. Amen. Would you stand and say with me what, what we believe using the words of affirmation from our brief statement of faith printed in your worship order? In life and in death, we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. We trust in God, whom Jesus called Abba, 
Father. In sovereign love, God created the world good and makes everyone equally in God's image, male and female, of every race and people, to live as one community. But we rebel against God. We hide from our Creator. Ignoring God's commandments, we violate the image of God in others and ourselves, accept lies as truth, exploit neighbor and nature, and threaten death to the planet entrusted to our care. We deserve God's condemnation, yet God redeems creation. In everlasting love, the God of Abraham and Sarah chose a covenant people to bless all families of the earth. Hearing their cry, God delivered the children of Israel from the house of bondage. Loving us still, God makes us heirs with Christ of the covenant. Like a mother who will not forsake her nursing child, like a father who runs to welcome the prodigal home, God is faithful still. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen.